Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. We have a, a very distinguished panel for you today. Um, we have some actors from the company and also the director of our production and a special guest. <clears throat> Let me start by introducing uh, Gilbert McCauley, who is on the far end. Gil is no stranger to The Rep or Little Rock. This is his eighth production, yes, eighth? Eighth production at The Rep. He's directed all sorts of plays, uh, Frost Nixon, uh, Fences, Piano Lesson, G's Bend, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. Yeah, he's directed all kinds of plays and um, has just done a wonderful job in terms of the variety of work. Uh, currently on staff at the University of Massachusetts and Amherst, it's always a pleasure to welcome him back to Little Rock. And next to Gil is Joy Lynn Jacobs. Joy is new to the rep, but has a, a tremendous career. She has Broadway credits, national tour credits. Um, she's a, a powerhouse, not only as an actress, but a singer. And we are thrilled that she's with us and making her debut at, uh, at the rep, playing Lola in Jar the Floor. And next to Joy Lynn is Shannon Lamb, who is uh, originally from Little Rock. And uh, Shannon, is this your sixth or seventh production? Uh, six, six, seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other productions she's appeared in are Full Monty and G's Bend and Mary Poppins, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but she has been now. She has transplanted herself out of love because Gil and Shannon are being married in two months, right? So, and they met at the rep doing G's Bend. So, how about that? Right. And directly to my right is our special guest, Dr. Leah Steele is on staff at Philander Smith College. She received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Arkansas Little Rock and her Master of Art from Marquette University and her PhD from St. Louis University. She is a smart woman. Uh, she's taught at 11 colleges and universities here and abroad and has been the Associate Professor of English and Chair of the Humanities Division at Philander Smith since 2001. She's taught courses in literature, writing, mythology, English as a second language, senior projects, developmental English, and more. She presented at Oxford University in the UK for the Oxford Roundtable and the Oxford Women's Leadership Symposium. She was the 2012-13 Lucerne Walsh? Lacerin Walsh? Lucerne Walsh. Lucerne Walsh, faculty award winner at uh, Philander uh, Smith College. And in her spare time, she volunteers in our props department in Arkansas Repertory Theater. So no wonder those props look so convincing, right? We have a PhD helping out. So I thought we would start um, by inviting Dr. Steele to tell us a little bit, um, give us a little insight. Um, she joined us uh, last week was it last week? Yes, I think it was last week, for uh, a, a symposium called Behind the Theme, uh, in which she talked about uh, Cheryl West's play and, the, uh, and its relationship to other uh, significant works by renowned African-American women authors. Dr. Steele? Thank you. Do I stay here? You, whatever you'd like. Do I have to use this? You should use that. <laughs> Is it on? Can you all hear me? Okay, cool. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm very excited to be here, especially to talk about such a great play uh, that's being produced by the Arkansas Rep, and I want to thank the Rep as well as the Clinton School for inviting me to do this. Um, Cheryl West's play is perhaps the wittiest, most well-written play I've read that captures, explores, and updates African-American mother-daughter relationships as a thematic subject. It covers over 90 years of American history in the process. Uh, 
I'm going to avoid accidentally releasing any spoilers because I know you're going to go to the play and enjoy it. Uh, so what I want to do is focus on the motifs, the ideas that breathe life into African-American mother-daughter relationships. So from Harriet Jacobs' Narratives in the Life of a Slave Girl to Sapphire's Push that you may know as the film Precious, the relationships between African-American mothers and daughters has been depicted as fraught with fights, dysfunction, pain, incest, rape, emotional, physical abuse, sacrifice, fear, love, mental illness, abandonment, resentment, and breaking free. As West herself puts it, and yet the love peeps through always, even as the battle lines are drawn in fear and fury. The reason behind these difficult and essential relationships is the unique position African-American women find themselves in as mothers and daughters, for they are descendants of enslaved women who survived traumas that I listed above, living today in a predominantly racist society that stereotypes, sexualizes, and discriminates against them. Most importantly, they are extraordinary survivors as well as thrivers. Further complications arise for them when the purpose of the mother-daughter relationship is looked at. Its purpose is to orient the daughter to self-knowledge, self-love, self-identity, relationship to family, culture, and language. Has added into it how to survive this dominant culture that does not value her and in fact may devalue her. Lastly, remember that the African-American mother will also have to work to support her daughter because husbands and fathers are often missing or abusive. Uh, West picks up these same motifs that I just listed uh, that we find in literature by African-American women writers such as Zora Neale Hurston, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, Solange, as well as Sapphire. So the relationship will be combative. They will be fighting to find their identity with each other. Uh, there will be a motif of sexual abuse, perhaps rape by the father, an uncle, someone else in the family. Mental illness will also be a recurring motif. The mothers and grandmothers often will work to uh, long days and long nights to provide better opportunities for their daughters, but the daughters will resent that because they'll miss their mothers and grandmothers and want more time with them. Uh, which then turns into, I made this sacrifice, why aren't you grateful? To, why weren't you here? I needed you here. One of the newest ways of dealing with this issue is, uh, for the young, becoming a lesbian is a route to freedom from the past, to identify in the present and in the future. And we see this again in the literature, look at the color purple, for example. The last motif, because I want to be quick so y'all can hear them, is uh, dance and song being used as the means to discover that freedom, to celebrate one's identity, to move beyond the scars. Uh, and that's where we get to Solange for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. She explores all these motifs herself, but Wes takes it to the next level. So I argue that West's Jar the Floor belongs in the canon of African-American literature with her peers because her depiction of the African-American mother-daughter relationship offers new insights into that thematic subject by addressing its motifs that I just listed in its own unique way. But I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to spoil it. Uh, as uh, West herself says, it's making peace with one's scars, with one's history, and one's mother. And the use of dance and song harkens all the way back to Africa. Uh, thank you.
Excellent. Thank you so much. So Little Rock and the Rep is very fortunate to have Gil on this production because he is, uh, has a long history with this production, don't you? You directed the, the very first professional production of this in Seattle, Washington. What year was that, Gil? <laughs> oh, use your mic so everyone... Yeah. 1991. That yeah, was right. Yeah. So you have a long history with this, and this is your fifth production? Fifth production, yeah. Right. And just before this production, you had directed a production. Yeah, we, I directed a production of this in Northampton, Mass., at the New Century Theater uh, that actually Shannon was a part of. Right. Mm -hmm. But before that, it had been many years. It had been many years. The last time I did it was back in Seattle, because I'd done it at uh, Oregon Shakespeare, and then we did it uh, at the Seattle Rep, and that was 2003. Right. And I hadn't, hadn't been back at the pr production since then. Right, so you, you started in the early 90s, and then uh, in, around 2003, and you come back to it. Mm -hmm. And the play clearly, from its first pro professional production, it, it has changed in yeah, some ways, hasn't it? Could changed. you describe that for us? Well, some of the changes really center around focusing on different characters, so there's more focus on their kind of through line through the play. And Cheryl has focused the writing uh, to fit what was, I think, a part of her own success because she began to see more success. Uh, her shows were then going to New York, and so she rewrote Jar the Floor to be more of a, to fit more with what she felt New York productions needed. And so at that point, it was, for instance, even the, the addition of the tree and some other things that come up in the, in the, those all came with the New York production. They weren't a part of the original, her original conception of the play. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also her success, uh, understanding how to tell a better story was just a part of that. So the play just got better over time. It did. So you feel that the current script, the script you're working on now, is an improvement over the... I, I think 19. it is. I think it is. I think there... Yeah, I think it's more, I think it's more focused. I think it's, I think it's more powerful. Uh, that isn't the, always the case. No. Sometimes it, that doesn't happen yet. <laughs> right. And sometimes. I actually ended up working with Cheryl over the years, uh, and we did another production that kind of did, you know, that did actually the opposite. It didn't get more focused. It, you know, it lost something. So it, that, that can happen when you're writing, when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to flesh out your idea more, more purely, that does happen. Right. Right. And how is it, <clears throat> how does it feel? This play, uh, it, there are five characters. Uh, they're all women. Four African-American women, four generations of a family. A great-grandmother, a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. And then uh, there's a Caucasian character, a friend of the youngest in the family. All women, all really strong. And here, Gil, you're directing a play. You're a man. <laughs> you're directing a play about, with an entire cast of women, and about mother-daughter relationships. How did that, how, how, did you feel like an outsider? Oh, oh definitely. I, mean, I think there's a way that you do kind of feel like an outsider. Uh, to some degree, I think that's always, uh, from what, I, what I've learned is, uh, the director is always kind of like an outsider, and so kind of being in that position, it, uh, it helps you, gives you a little objectivity on it. Um, but I think with this, because I had worked with Cheryl, I met Cheryl West in graduate school. Uh, at that time, she was a journalism um, graduate student. And uh, she came to me because she was interested in writing plays. And I happened to be a graduate student who was in, involved in theater. And so we talked and talked about how she might go about doing that. And so that's how our relationship ap actually began. Um, and then I also, over time, I met her family and I came to kind of understand where this writing was coming from. And so I think the only reason why I've continued to do the play is because I do have a kind of a, an insight into both Cheryl, Cheryl's work uh, and to the, the ethos that she's kind of writing out of. Right, right. So Joy Lynn's career has been, you've done so many musicals because you have an amazing singing voice. And here you are doing this play where music is actually a part of the fabric of the world. But it's not, you know, you don't necessarily get to sing a great song, right? And that, and does that, how do you feel about doing a, a play where you have to hide your light under a bushel basket in some ways? Um, 
Lola is a very complex character, but first and foremost, she's comfortable in her own skin. Um, and I have to say that, yes, I started in opera, went to musical theater, and there are night times when I'm in the middle of a scene in the show that I keep waiting for the song to come up and save me. <laughs> but it's not there. It's an easy transition in reality, this particular play, because uh, there is so much dialogue. Everything, every moment in the show is crafted with an arc, just the way a song would be crafted. So I just approach it pretty much the same way. Right. Great, yeah. great observation. There is a lot of music in the language, isn't there? Yes, a great deal. And it helps when you're working with a phenomenal cast, even Shannon. And, um, <laughs> and an amazing director. And how I ended up between them, I have no idea. <laughs> Luck of a draw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Shannon, you, you just finished a production. Was it three months ago, four months ago? Uh, four months ago. Four months ago with Jar of the Floor. And here you are again. Uh, same director, but you're dealing with four completely different women. And how is that, how, was that hard to adjust? Because um, each actor, of course, makes specific choices based upon their own uh, instincts and their own experiences. And of course, the play is the play, but an actor's performance illuminates certain parts of um, a character differently. So now you're surrounded by, you're playing the same part, mm -hmm. and you're the same director but you have these four other women. Was that a hard adjustment to make? Uh, it wasn't a hard adjustment to make, but I did, I did feel the adjustment. Um, I didn't go into it thinking that everything that was set the last time I was a part of the production that, that Gilbert did would be the same because different actors, someone's gonna bring something different to it. This Lola isn't gonna be like that Lola, like that Lola, everyone's different. But I did find myself <laughs> when we first started rehearsal because I already knew uh, the show really well and I knew this comes next, that comes next, I would already be prepping for the next thing, like, okay, this is where the slap goes in the... And, um, and they, the other actors were like, what is she doing? And Gilbert would be like, okay, we're not there yet. And I was like, no, but remember, because he was just like, we're not there yet. <laughs> and so I was like, you're right, we're not, I'm sorry. But um, it's so refreshing. It's so not the same. I can completely understand what he uh, means when he says it's not the same show every time because this is a different cast, a fresh perspective, and the way my daughter, Vinny, play, this uh, actress, uh, Maya, plays Vinny is completely different than somebody. And, and so it makes me completely react different because I don't do what, how I would react before. So it's really good. It's a fresh, fresh perspective. Right. And the other thing that's, uh, or another thing that, of course, is a variable with every performance, right? you have a completely different audience, right? So that informs uh, a performance into a great deal. Last night, uh, last night every, for every production at the Rep, we do a pay what you can night. And that's on the first, uh, it's first, it's the Wednesday preview. And um, people arrive at theater incredibly early and they line up around the, around the block and they can pay, you know, five, ten dollars for a ticket. And last night was uh, pay what you can. And it was an electric house, right? It was a house unlike any other you had experienced. And the thing is, tonight won't be that way. Right, and so you're going to have to learn how to play. How do you keep? How do you keep invested when you don't necessarily get the reaction that you had hoped to get? I don't wait. I don't go on stage. Um, my character doesn't depend on eliciting a reaction from the audience. Great. I go out and and give them as honest a portrayal of the character as I possibly can. Um, in it, in with pardon the expression, but balls to the walls. I mean, I'm just gonna go, it's gonna be 150% every single time. And eventually, the audience comes along. I lay out an invitation and say, here I am, this is what I'm doing. Come with me or don't, it's up to you. And usually, they come along. So, you know, we've been told, we had an audience the other day, they said, oh, they're gonna be quiet. Yeah, I don't allow that. 
I go out and we go out and give it all and they came right along with us. Mm, quiet, my behind. <laughs> You'll see. Right, I mean, it's absolutely, your approach I think is absolutely right. I mean, you, you, you remain true to the moment and to the work. But the, the other thing that's so fascinating about an actor, an actor has to always be in the moment, to be honest, and then think about what's coming up next and take in what's happening out there. Because of course, if you, know, if you do elicit a very a large response, you're gonna have to pause a little bit to let them enjoy the laugh. Because the last thing an actor wants to do is step on a laugh. Because then the audience is gonna think, oh, we can't laugh. You don't want that. Especially in this play, because the first part of the play is so hilarious, funny. So funny. And, and when Joy comes in, she, there's this surge of energy hitting the stage and there's a great deal of, of, of humor in it. But then it goes somewhere else. And I, I'm interested to know, Shannon, maybe you can talk about it because you've done the play now a couple of times. How do you, you know, how, how do you make it seamless in terms of act, you know, the first couple scenes are so funny and then we're, you know, it, Cheryl actually takes it to a different place. You know, I really struggled with that when I first read the, uh, the play um, uh, the last time I, I, was, I, I was in it, I read it and I was like, oh, this is so great, this is so hilarious. I knew nothing about Jar the Floor. This is hilarious. And then I got towards the end and I, was, I had to put it down because it's so, it, um, Gilbert has often said that it's written about Cheryl West, that she writes plays that make you laugh and then punch you in the stomach. You are in, on such a ride. A it's such a high, it's hilarious. It's back and forth and mother and daughter and being silly and you did this and you did that and then it completely turns left and I wasn't mentally prepared for it and I had to, okay, and then the actor in me just went through and did the work and took apart May D. And just like anyone, you know, we're not all one-sided. People are, people, you know, you catch me today, I may be up, upbeat, but, but I go through something just like anybody else, and I, it can take me to a broken place, and then there's something that can take me to a devastated place, and it, all of, you just get to see all of that in the span of one day. Um, but I found those places in May D where it honestly happens. Where when she's up, upbeat and joking with her mom, that's honest and true. And when she's being very, I can't let anyone know that I'm affected and this is bothering me and I'm uncomfortable. Oh no, I have to remain in control because she's very much a control freak and everything has to stay proper and in its place. And then there's that part of her that just like wants to hold on and stay in control, but then she can't anymore. And she has to release it. And she does. Hmm. And so I was able to find that. And um, it is, ex someone said to me, how do you do it every night? Because when you see the show by the end of the night, it, you know, it, it, it's a roller coaster. And um, I realized in rehearsal, this is not a show you can fake. Being an actor, we've done shows where, okay, my scene's coming up. I can do it with my eyes closed. You just go through it and you can bring whatever emotion or, or the song. This is not that show. The audience will know if you are not present, if, if you're not being honest. So you just have to open up yourself and allow yourself to go there every night. Mm. And the payoff is so rich mm. because the people just really connect to it and really appreciate honesty. People appreciate you being honest. Mm. So Gil, five productions, you directed in Seattle, and you directed in, in Oregon, you directed in uh, Massachusetts, and here, I'm forgetting someplace. Well, we did twice in Seattle. Twice First in was Seattle. at the Empty Space, and then the second time at was at, the, at Seattle Rep. Right. Yeah. So, very different communities, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the audience, in terms of demographics, have been different. How do, how do, the dif how do different audiences tend to react differently to this play? Well, I mean, I think that there are some audiences that feel, at first, when they uh, sit there, that this is something different from them. So that you know, they feel like maybe we don't know who these people are, and it's only after going through uh, the play and experiencing it that they then begin to understand. Oh no, I do know that person. 
um, even for me, like I said, di directing, it's like, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a woman, but I, I had a mother. I had a sister. <laughs> I watched my sister and my mother, you know, go through some of this same stuff. Um, I'm also now a parent, and I know that, you know, I feel very differently about um, young people now, at least the ones who are running around my house. I feel very differently <laughs> about, you know, that relationship than I did when, before I had, had kids. So I think that the first response of the audience is, is like, okay, I'm not sure who these people are, because they, may, they come off maybe a little bit different, maybe a little bit more eccentric, maybe a little bit more... Um, larger than life than, you know, folks you know. But then after a while, you begin to recognize, oh, no, I, I recognize it. And, and a guy walked out of the theater each night. It's, it's a, it, it, I run into somebody who's leaving the theater, a, a man who will leave and says, I got to go call my mother. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but it's, there's a way that, that this play, it does remind you of, you know, it, it reminds you of those, those real connections that we have. And that's what, the, that's what I think is important about it. That, you know, listening to um, uh, Dr. Steele talk about the play, I, I, I realized that Cheryl wrote with an understanding that all those motifs that she mentioned are there, but we don't live motifs. You know, that, 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 there, there, are, there are some things that are about that, but that's not, what, that's not the lived experience. And so what Cheryl really tries to do is to climb into that lived experience. And what this play can do that I think in a way separate, separates it from the literature is that you get a chance to actually feel that lived experience, which takes it to another space. And, you know, when, you, when, you, when, you, um, when you're able to do that, I think it, it, you receive it differently. And that's what that's what's powerful. So that yeah, there's the 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 difference is that sometimes audiences are quieter, sometimes they laugh less, but the thing that is the same is that people come out moved, and so sometimes they're quietly moved, sometimes they're you know um, emotionally more loudly moved, but they come away, they come out moved, and so I think that's the that's the, that's the one thing I have noticed. Great, yeah. So it's it's really about trusting the work, isn't it? No, I mean, no matter what you get back from the house, it's trusting the play is really strong. Uh, the yeah, direction is superb. You know, they have the they have the right environment. You have you're wearing the right clothes. You're wearing <laughs> you know you've done you've done your homework. You've done your work, and it's just then trusting and then accepting what what the audience gives you back, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I've, I've begun to play approach direction. Um, Kind of with that understanding that Ray Charles had about about music is like we're gonna make it do what it do, and once you figure out what it do, then you just have to figure out how to make it do what it do, and that's what the actors do. They figure that out, and in the course of the rehearsal process, we figure that out. And each night, then just like Joy was saying, it's not about we're not playing the audience; we're playing the music. And in this case, it's the music of that play. It's the music of that emotion. It's the music of those, the lives of those people that they are playing, and they got to hit those notes. And they know which ones they got to hit, and they do. And that's what I think makes it. I think that's what makes it work. Right. And just in case anyone's confused by what to me is a really important point, um, this is a play of primarily about this African-American characters, this four generation of African-American women. But it is, the themes are colorless because you come in and mothers, daughters, grandmothers, matriarchs have been the legs that families stand on. And everyone will see something from their own family in this, uh, aside from in the African-American tradition when you talk about the song and dance and that came from Africa through slavery. Um, then comes another character within the play who's bent on education because as a modern African-American woman, she's making a, a valid point, an essential point that yes, we cannot ignore our culture, but we must move forward and the only way to do that is with education. It's, it's an amazing piece because it hits all the markers that people need to hear. And truly, to me, it's colorless. Hmm. Can I, I just, yeah, I was <laughs> waiting for the right moment to, to just, we were thinking the same thing. I wanted a moment just to, to say that. It's because, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> like in real life, we're so much alike, it's so weird. Um, 
uh, in interviews, people have asked, so what, um, so this is an African-American play, and, and to echo what Joy said, yes, uh, you get to look at uh, these African-American women who are telling this story. However, uh, the different, uh, the, uh, the diverse um, audience that's come to see it and that I've known in the past that have come to see it, you are not moved just because you're African-American and you see it and you're like, yeah, that could be like my aunt. It doesn't matter. Everyone, everyone, uh, irrelevant of, 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 of race, has a connection with um, a family relationship, has a connection with, oh, we're all trying to put up the best front we can because we gotta do this, to, we gotta get through this together, and then, oh, it falls apart, and, or, and then there's this one person in the family who is like the black sheep who's doing something that's making us all look bad, and we're all like, oh, we gotta, what are we gonna do about it? Everyone, so it, in, in, in my mindset, mindset, and every time I've discussed this play, it crosses a color line. I don't say that it's a, a, a black play. You could be purple, and you're not purple. <laughs> but you would walk away with something from this. It's an observation of an African-American family, but it does not stand apart from yeah. humanity. This could be any. At all. In, in fact, I think the addition of that fifth character was Wes saying, uh, this is for all of us. I was given the topic of African-American mother-daughter relationships, and by the way, there's very little research on that outside of the literature and very little written about that except in the literature. But with the addition by West of that fifth character, when I read the play, I thought about my own mother, my grandmother. I didn't have an opportunity. I only know my great-grandmother mythically in terms of what I've been told of her. But it moved me in that way, and so I really felt that that was deliberate on her part. And then the other thing that theater offers, I was originally a theater English major, um, uh, that reading a novel by yourself doesn't offer, or even sitting in a movie theater watching a film, is there's an interaction between the audience the actors and the audience that becomes both individual and universal so that you share something, you have an experience, the energy moves between the actors and the audience, between the audience members that you can't get. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love reading and I read a lot of books, but it's an individual experience. It's not a group experience. And so I want to confirm. Yeah, no, that, that, that. Uh, collective experiencing, and I, I think that's what you were talking about the crowd last night, is, is, uh, it was to watch a group of people come and sit down in that, in that dark theater and have a collective experience. And I think that's why we go to the theater, is that, yeah, we do want to enjoy ourselves as individuals, but there is something about that collective experience where we all come together to hear this story and to see how we all feel about it in that same room together. That is a different. That is a different experience, and uh, yeah. it's it's wonderful to see the you know to to have an audience enjoy a piece and, and experience it like that. So just so that they can get that connection that the play is is so much about. Right. So it's it's fun to track, and maybe when you see the play, you'll feel the same way that I did. Track relationship from great-grandmother to grandmother, grandmother to mother, mother to daughter, and see what has been passed down in terms of, you know, there's, the, uh, there's a uh, phrase, sins of the father. Well, maybe this, you know, in this case, maybe it's sins of the mother. But to watch, you know, watch what the dynamic, what informed this relationship, how the daughter then passes on to her daughter, and her daughter passes on to her daughter. But then what's really, and maybe you can jump in, um, really interesting is, then you, but you also see how they're, they're able to take it a little bit further, right? Each generation able to take a little bit further. Well, every, every generation's of, uh, I don't care what color you are, your mother, you grow up, I grew up desperate not to be my mother. Uh, I love my mother. My mother has, my mother grew up on a dirt farm, and I have the bill of, I have the bill of sale for my great great grandmother, when she was sold for tax purposes. Her and her and two children. Um, and notice I said great great. That ain't that far back. Not that far back. 
Um, and my mother was one of 10 children living on a dirt farm in South Carolina. She was determined when she finally got to school that she was gonna get rise above. So she now has more degrees than a thermometer, and, um, <laughs> including a doctorate in education. But, and as, and, but she was so adamant about it and pushing it so hard that of course, you know, I rebelled as fast as I could. And yes, my mother for most my life talked like this and no one's quite sure why. Uh, and then we went down south to visit and she started talking like this and I'm like, who are you? So even more, I, by the time I was 13, I'm like, I don't wanna be this crazy lady cause she's, <laughs> but no matter what we do, as ladies, and, and men too. Men don't want to be their fathers. They grew up with that. Um, by osmosis, we will retain some of who, because we are as much a part of our environment, and there's nothing we can do about that. And then I came to a, I looked at my mother one day. I think it was the day of my second wedding after I sent my first husband back to his mother. <laughs> and I said, you know what, my mother's okay. My mother has taught me a lot. She has persevered through all my rebellions. She has not kicked me out of the house <laughs> when she probably should have a few times. And she has always been there for me to fall back on. And I could only wish that if I had been lucky enough to have children, I would have done that. Now I didn't have any children, but I did learn to teach. So I'm an artist in residence for schools in South Carolina. And I see these kids and all I wanna do is be there to lift them up. I wanna raise the bar so high that they jump for it, and those kids do every single time. And I realized my enthusiasm for that came from my mother. <laughs> I can't deny it. And it's, it's in this play, we fight hard to deny the little bits of our mother. She fights hard to deny me. Her daughter fights hard to deny that bit of her. But in reality, the strength that we battle against each other with came from each other. And it's clear as a bell. Mm. So in preparation for this production, our, um, our audience engagement department reached out to some uh, leading African-American ladies in this community to get their opinion in terms of what they thought of the play. And the reactions were really interesting. But one woman who, um, who was invited to join us um, she decided that she did not want to participate because she found the relationships to be stereotypical in this play. She found that, so the motifs that Dr. Steele was talking about in terms of recurring motifs in um, African American literature written by women, she found to be actually a little offensive because she felt it, it really seemed to buttonhole um, and, and did not transcend the stereotypes. And I'm interested to hear what the three of you think in terms of that. Do you, did you, feel, that there, do you feel that there are stereotypes that are in any way offensive in, 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 in Cheryl West's play? I, I think people will find offense anywhere they want. I'm sorry, but I do. I think that. Um, I think stereotypes are all around us, unfortunately. And if that's all they find in this play, then I don't think they're looking hard enough. Mm. Or open. I don't think they're open enough. Um, the number one reason why when I'm doing interviews and someone asks, oh, so this, this is a black family, this is a black play, and it's a representation of, of black families, the reason why that feels really abrasive to me is because this play is not an example of what happens in every black family. To say that is ridiculous. It's just the same to say if it were a white family that had a, a person with a drug addiction or this person was um, uh, abusive or this, to say that all white families are like that is ridiculous. This is just a snapshot of one particular family. And the reason why it could be any, anyone in the audience can relate to it is because 
we all, May D is my character, okay? And I, I, Lola, she's my mom. Lola went so far. She didn't have degrees. I then went to school and I have three degrees and I'm, I'm pushing for tenure at this great university and I have my daughter behind me who decides she wants to go sing. <laughs> sing, not get a degree, not pursue something of, that's gonna put, and I'm like, what? That is something that I have, I've lived in New York for 13 years, I have all types of different friends and their own mothers are the same way. They're like, you're gonna do what? <laughs> no, you're gonna get a, you're not gonna be an actor, you're gonna get a real job with benefits. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I can understand how that, um, that woman was uh, offended, but I think when you look at it, when you, when you label it as, this is the black experience, you are doing it a huge disservice. It is not the black experience. It is an experience of this particular family which could match any color across the country. For that matter, I know some people that were offended by steel magnolias for the same reason. They said it was too stereotypical of Southern women. Yeah. And that's just silly. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I, I think it, it's, I, I think the, the point, as, I, as someone said, is it, there, there's a validity to saying, oh, I can see, I could see where you might think of it in, in that way, but it really has to do with your, the, your own lens. And I, I feel like so much of what we're talking about is like the lens that you bring to it. So if your lens is limited, it, it probably may, you, might, you, may, you may feel that way just reading it. But I also think there's no way you could experience it that way. And that's why I said that, you know, the motifs sound f familiar. When you talk about, you look at the motifs in the play, you look at the motifs that you might see in other African-American literature, you could say, yeah, those things, I see those. But we don't, we don't live motifs. We, we really do have a lived experience that is very different. And so how those things feel on a lived level is what the play is trying to get at. And what I think is what, what's so honest about Cheryl's writing is that she was able to do that, is she was able to take those things which exist there. And all of those, it's funny, all of those things do show up in the play to some degree, but the lived, the, the, way, that, the way that feels on a lived out level is so much richer. And so a stereotype is something that is, that is not rich. A stereotype is a limited two-dimensional um, experience, right. but what Cheryl does is it brings to that something much richer, much deeper, and something that makes one rethink those very stereotypes. Great. And I think that's what's important about the work, and that's what's why her work is why she's continued to grow as a writer and 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 and, and be so successful. Beautiful. It's funny because one of the other things I notice about stereotypes is the way people, a character talks, the way a character talks they are labeled a stereotype. They can be labeled a stereotype, like steel magnolias. If you speak with a southern accent and you go north, they automatically think you're stupid because you speak with a southern accent. Lola speaks, Lola is not educated, but she's been educated um, by life, but she doesn't have the degrees that her daughter has. But Lola's not stupid. Lola's a bright woman who worked very hard to provide for her daughter and, and help her daughter achieve the goals that she has. Just because she speaks from the hood doesn't mean that she's an idiot. And that, I think, is where people get bogged down with the stereotypes. They hear, they see the way the, co the, dress, the dress is, which it, the costumes, I'm not going to divulge Lola's costumes. But uh, she may be colorful and she may speak with colorfully and without the proper educated cadence, but that does not make her a stereotype, not to me. So uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask anything. Yes, ma'am. A microphone's coming to you. You've talked about Steel Magnolia. I saw it off Broadway when it first came out and I was sitting there and people were laughing and I thought, what are they laughing at? <laughs> and then I realized they were laughing at the, at the uh, dialect, I mean, you know. So my question is, um, is the play received differently, by uh, the personality of the audience in the North, uh, than it would be in the South? 
Well, I'm, like I said, I think that you know audiences do respond to some degree differently. I did, I did actually mention to John, I realized that there's an aspect of the way that Cheryl writes that actually has a very Southern sensibility because we had, we, the, so, so far all the audience have, have really responded, they've re responded to the humor in subtle ways that I didn't notice, for instance, in Seattle or in Northampton. And it has to do with the understanding that Southern sensibility. That's, so that's white, black, all across the board, there's that sensibility. And I realized that part of the reason for that is uh, Cheryl writes very specifically she writes about her experience, which is her parents, grandparents from Mississippi who migrated to Chicago. And we call that, we call that up south because all those folks who moved from Chicago to, to, to uh, St. Louis to Detroit, like my folks, that we just call that up south because you still hang on to some of those same sensibilities that that your you know that that your uh, family had where that where that comes from and so I didn't realize how southern that was until we came down here and realized oh the, the people are connecting with that because it there, it, this, it just has that same there's a similarity to that feel so uh, I think the sensibility may be what we're talking about even more than the dialect there is a sensibility that people do do get in terms of Cheryl's writing. There is a, a kind of a, an honesty to it, uh, an honesty that is not based on politeness or a particular kind of protocol. It's based on understanding of the world, the, the lived world that, that, you know, that I think is maybe more of a, a, a southern sensibility than it is a northern sensibility. So in that respect, I think that, yes, Cheryl's writing is um, more relatable <laughs> here. Uh, here. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost a little north versus south when between her, the education of her versus her mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone kind else? Uh, 2017 is the 60th anniversary of the integration crisis here in Little Rock. And somehow this seems symbolic in a way in terms of bringing an awareness back to us, the white community in Little Rock. Uh, and also I'm wondering if there was any concern about, from the theater about a play that is basically oriented around a black family would have enough of an audience appeal to be able to support the production. Um, well, I, I did not program this play. This, this season was actually programmed by my predecessor. I am thrilled that Bob chose to include this play in the season. Uh, one of the reasons I was so intrigued at the invitation to join you here in Little Rock is because the Rep is the only professional theater in Little Rock and the only theater of its kind for 300 mile radius. So I, I lived for many years in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there were many professional theaters. You had Penumbra, which is one of the best black theaters in the country in St. Paul. It, it, that's, they, and August Wilson was a playwright in residence there when he was live. They do superb work. You had mixed blood theater. You had Theater Moo, which is about the um, Asian American. You had the Playwright Center, which is about new plays. You had Chanhassen, which was musical theater. The rep needs to actually speak to all of our community. We owe that to this community, to speak to everybody. And so I think it's important that when we pick a season, as Bob picked this season, that we find plays that represent the people in Little Rock. And my feeling is, and what was touched so beautifully upon uh, our guests here, is that within the uh, specific lies the universal. And the specific human experience, if it's an African American experience, if it's an Asian American experience, if it's the gay experience, if no matter what your experience is, within that is humanity. 
and that speaks to all of us. So uh, I, I believe this play will speak to audiences of all kinds. It may speak to women more directly than men. It may speak to people in the African American community more than in to others. But it's going to speak to everybody. And we have a responsibility at the Rep to do a breadth of work that speaks to everybody. And I want to piggyback and remind you that it's the 140th anniversary of the founding of Philander Smith College in 1877. So uh, this is a very significant year, I believe. Just uh, Arkansas's only historic black college, part of the Freedmen Act in 1877, partnership with the United Methodist Church. I mean, this is an amazing phenomenon and something we need to brag about in Arkansas that even with Central High 60 years ago, was 140 years ago that we stepped up to begin with. Great. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi, Santa. Santa and I go back uh, in religious circles, and I've enjoyed her vocals when she delivers uh, gospel songs and uh, she is so talented and has such a beautiful spirit but speaking on the spirit uh, as you can tell by my collar and uh, uh, the work that I do a lot of it does entail addressing the uh, relationships of mothers daughters and grandmothers uh, and I cross into different generations and I'm uh, addressed by them to resolve the issues that are going on and without taking sides, I think some of you may understand what I'm saying, even some of you in, here in the audience. And so I, I was wondering, in the initial writing of the play, was there any inclusion about religion or spirituality for the women because the women make up the church, especially in the black community. And uh, when they have things at home going on, sometimes they come to the man of God, woman of God. And I didn't know if her original writing, she had something. I have not seen the play. I've read about it and it may be something in there that I don't know till I see the play. But I was wondering with the, the dynamics of the relationships and generational gaps, was there some commonality with a spirituality or a religious type thing going on? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Reverend Grissom, first of all, last week I reached out to your wife, Sister Grissom, and you all, whenever you want to come, tickets are waiting. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> My father is an AME pastor, and so Reverend Grissom has known me and my sister since we were a little bitty coming up in the AME church. So, yeah. Um, so, so, but there is, there is a huge uh, part of spirituality in the play and you'll appreciate it. Uh, one of the members of the family just dives all the way in and everything is Jesus and the Lord. And <laughs> So there is that in the play. Gilbert can speak more to it. Yeah, I, I think that Cheryl understood that there, there, there is that basis. That, that's, that's kind of always, that, that, that is one thing, um, in the mo in, even in the, in the motifs, I was, I, I'm not sure if I actually heard that, because I think that that's also something that's always there. It's a part of um, the background for African-American life here. Uh, at the same time, I think she does try to look at a reality to, well, a reality of that, which is also that the way that changes generationally and, that, and, and how that also works out. And so in the play, I think you'll, you'll, you'll recognize that, that change too. Uh, that, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Please come and see it.